I'm very pleased to be able to introduce Captain Lee Moak of the Airline Pilots Association here today. There are a few well-worn cliches in the English language that have become adopted as accepted wisdom. For example, what's the most important thing about real estate? Location, location, location. How do you get to Carnegie Hall? Practice, practice, practice. I'd like to suggest a new one. How do you introduce your boss to give a Washington keynote speech? Carefully, carefully, <laughs> carefully. Captain Lee Moak is the ninth president of ALPA, which represents nearly 50,000 professional airline pilots in the United States and Canada, and is the largest non-governmental aviation safety organization in the world. He was elected by ALPA's board of directors in October of 2010 and began his four-year term on January 1, 2011. Captain Moak is a member of the AFL-CIO Executive Council, as well as the Executive uh, Committee of the AFL-CIO Transportation Trades Department. He also serves on the FAA NextGen Advisory Committee and was recently appointed to serve on the FAA Management Advisory Council. <clears throat> Excuse me. Captain Mokes fl flies the 767 for Delta Airlines and uh, stays current on the aircraft while managing to hold down his ALPA job, leading pilots in their efforts to advance the profession and the industry. He served his three terms as chairman of the Delta Pilots Master Executive Council within ALPA during Delta's bankruptcy recovery and successful merger with Northwest. Now, it's important to know that Captain Moak is a Marine, having served nine years as a United States Marine Corps fighter pilot before transitioning to the Naval Air Reserve. And as a Marine, tirelessly determined to pursue whatever mission is before him, he has been an especially active ALPA president in Washington. Here are just a few examples of his agenda. He championed FAA reauthorization, advocated the adoption of the FAA's pilot rest rules, supported a pathway to next gen, and spearheaded the implementation of TSA's known crew member security program. And that was just his first week. As most of you know, Captain Moak has overseen ALPA's effort, joining with others to reform the export-import banks, wide-body aircraft practices, and is currently calling attention to government policies that put U.S. and Canadian air carriers and their pilots at a disadvantage versus state-supported foreign competitors. He's the first to say that airline pilots are pro-competition, but has reiterated that pilots and their airlines need a level playing field to have a fighting chance in the global marketplace. On the collective bargaining side, during his term, ALPA pilots have ratified 19 new contracts, including the agreement at the merged United and Continental. And this work has brought praise from what in the past would have been an unlikely quarter, Wall Street. Hunter Kay, the airline analyst at Wolf Research, wrote this last month, quote, ALPA in recent years has transformed itself under the leadership of Captain Lee Moak as an organization that seeks pragmatic, cooperative solutions with the management teams of the companies whose pilots it represents. The culture of each pilot union is more localized than many investors realize, but ALPA's central leadership still goes a long way to establish a way of doing business, in our opinion, unquote. I'll close with one other important thing to know about Captain Moak. His home is in New Orleans. And in the spirit of that city, he cares about building relationships, morale, and working together. And so even though we're now in the season of Lent, I do hope that you'll join me in giving a Mardi Gras welcome to the president of the Airline Pilots Association, Captain Lee Moak. Carefully, carefully, carefully. Well, thanks for that introduction and for the privilege of being invited to speak before the International Aviation Club. But first, I'd like to focus, to refocus everyone back and to acknowledge the deep sadness and concern that I know that everyone in this room shares with me regarding Malaysian Airlines Flight 370. So many questions remain unanswered. It's premature to speculate in any way about what might have happened, though the International Federation of Airline Pilots Association, uh, ALPA, has offered any and all assistance we can provide to the crews, colleagues, and to the accident investigators. We continue to keep all of those involved in our thoughts.
few world events embody the spirit of competition more than the Olympics. Since they were first held some 3,000 years ago, the games have tested human performance in an international arena founded on fair play. Like uh, was just uh, told to you, many of you, uh, or I guess all of you now know that I'm from New Orleans and in years past, uh, Chris Paul was a hometown favorite at the Olympics and he played basketball as a New Orleans Hornet, uh, now known as the Pelicans, another story, um, <laughs> for many years and later won gold for the United States as part of the 2008 Dream Team and again in 2012. In Sochi this year, 88 countries competed in the Olympic Winter Games. 26 nations won gold, silver, or bronze, but 10 nations took home three quarters of the medals. And without a doubt, every athlete who has earned the opportunity to compete in the Olympics has tremendous natural talent and years of training. But it's no coincidence that home nation factors like financial backing from the state and a national priority on winning helps these individuals make the most of their abilities. In addition, the International Olympic Committee, which describes itself as the supreme authority of the games, has a goal to ensure that in sport, the spirit of fair play prevails. There's no question that every Olympic athlete aspires to bring home the gold. While they still make a difference, home country advantages in the Olympics are balanced with international oversight and regulations that help ensure athletes compete on a level playing field. Okay, so I know you're gonna say that I'm biased and I'll just go ahead and admit it. Uh, to me, U.S. airline employees are just like Olympic athletes. It might not always be the case in terms of sporting ability, but I can assure you we are equals in our drive to compete and prevail against our opponents. But just like the Olympics, U.S. airline employees need a fair playing field. The fact is we don't have one, and adding to an already tilted playing field are critical global economic threats that are a result of a flawed U.S. Open Skies model. Currently, our country's Open Skies agreements fail to take into account the state's support of foreign airlines. They also could fail to block U.S. airline competitors from using a flag of convenience business plan that exploits regulatory, tax, and labor laws to gain an unfair economic advantage. And I'll have a little more on that in a minute. Many foreign countries own their airlines outright and equip them, equip them to compete with clear-cut economic advantages. In these countries, the degree of their national airline success is vital to their nation's future economic diversity and well-being. And you know, as Americans, we can't change that. We can't change their focus, and we shouldn't try to. But as a result of the priority these nations place on their airlines, many U.S. airline foreign competitors play by different rules, whether the foreign airline has an unlimited bank account, or pays no corporate tax, or operates under minimum regulatory policies, its state backing is a powerful marketplace advantage. So what does the state backing mean for U.S. airlines? That our foreign competitors' infrastructure, airports, and airlines are growing rapidly. And that sometimes the rules they're playing by are not only different, they also lead to a clear competitive imbalance. We all remember the $162 billion in aircraft orders that were placed in Dubai this past November. I attended the air show and I flew Emirates into Dubai's Terminal 3. This is a $4.5 billion terminal. And after I pulled in, I could look out and see row after row after row of 
new wide-body aircraft, A380s and 777s, and that was proof positive to me of the staggering growth made by unlimited, non-market-based capital. So I walked through the terminal knowing that by 2020, Emirates plans to abandon that airport. Moving to the other side of the Emirate, practically on top of Abu Dhabi, into a new mega terminal at what will be the largest airport in the world, 10 times larger than Dubai's current airport. You know, it also helps to do business in a bureaucracy that is so vertically integrated that in the case of Dubai, it's actually one person. So imagine having the authority of the Federal Aviation Administration and the National Bank and the National Oil Company and the airport authority all in one person. Oh, and in case I forget to mention, that person is the chairman of the board of the airline, too. The winning combination of an unlimited bank account and a national commitment to their airline industry's growth in many foreign countries generates powerful results for U.S. airline competitors and their hub airports. And again, I want to underscore this concept. We're not trying to change what they do, okay? We shouldn't try to, but we have to be mindful of what we're doing. How about an example of that, okay? An example of something else there. At Doha International Airport, they recorded a 9.9% year-over-year passenger growth increase in 2013, handling more than 23 million passengers. And at Abu Dhabi International Airport, where I toured the future site of a new midfield terminal, passenger numbers grew by more than 12%. The UAE's national airline, not Emirates, but Etihad Airways, recently launched service to Washington, D.C., among other U.S. routes, and it continues its rapid expansion as the world's, as the world's fastest growing airline. Today, Emirates is starting flights from Dubai to Boston, the airline's eighth route into the United States. And these airlines are also building their air cargo routes, their freighter fleets, and air cargo infrastructure at enormous rates. As the president of Emirates said to this group in September 2012, and I'll quote him here, today, oil makes up 5% of Dubai's gross domestic product, while aviation makes up 28% or $22 billion, as well as directly and indirectly supporting over 250,000 jobs. This is a direct result. This is a direct result of Dubai's pro-aviation policy and a vision of the leadership, end quote. So ALPA has called on U.S. government leaders to create and act on a vision for the U.S. airline industry and to make pro-aviation policy decisions based on it. But right now, U.S. airlines do not benefit from and are often econ economically harmed by our own government policies. So let me give you a few examples of that. Earlier this year, the U.S. government opened a Customs and Border Protection preclearance facility at Abu Dhabi International Airport in defiance of a broad coalition of opponents, including many of you in this room, and ranging from, and you can't make this up, okay, ranging from the Chamber of Commerce and the AFL-CIO and ACI North America and A4A, among many others, all opposed to it. And by operating a preclearance facility at an airport where no U.S. air carrier flies, the U.S. government is in effect handing a state-backed airline, Etihad Airways, a major competitive advantage over U.S. airlines. Etihad Airways, at, and at the same time, the funding of the facility drains U.S. taxpayer money and resources that would be better used to improve customs facilities at major U.S. airports. And for those of you who don't have global entry, reduce those lines from four hours to something respectable. Now, by approving the funding in January, 
congressional appropriators ignored the intent of proposed language that was widely endorsed by industry and labor in the bipartisan Mian DeFazio bill. That legislation, which had 133 co-sponsors, would have required the U.S. government to perform an evaluation of the potential effect on U.S. airlines and CBP staffing before it could establish a new facility. I understand that the U.S. government is now planning to invest additional U.S. taxpayer resources by operating a new preclearance facility at Dubai International Airport and perhaps at Doha and other points in the Persian Gulf. But unlike Abu Dhabi, U.S. airlines do fly to Dubai. But of the 1,054 flights in January of this year, between the United States and the three hub airports of the Middle East, state-owned foreign-backed airlines operated 930 of the flights, and U.S. airlines operated 124. So it's clear, it's clear who really benefits, and it's not U.S. airlines or their workers. In another example, where we commend Congress for requiring the U.S. Export-Import Bank to conduct economic impact studies, the bank studies are set up to rubber stamp their financing proposals. Instead, before extending any financing, the bank should meet its legal obligation to evaluate whether proper balance exists between the financing's potential harm and its potential benefit to U.S. industry or U.S. employment. An important evaluation, an element of that evaluation, is for the bank to look at the effect of the wide-body aircraft financing on an aircraft's entire network, not just a single route. And make no mistake, the effect of the bank's economic studies and the financing that they lead to is very real. It's very real for U.S. airlines and airline industry workers. Last year, the XM Bank approved $7.9 billion, with a B, $7.9 billion in financing for U.S.-made airliners to be operated by U.S. airline competitors. Now, while U.S. airlines cannot access XM Bank financing, their state-owned competitors in countries such as the UAE take full advantage of the benefit. And for example, three UAE companies uh, Emirates, Etihad Airways, and Dubai Aerospace Enterprise Limited received more than $900 million in financing guarantees in 2013. Now, with the XM Bank's current authorization expiring on September 30th, we have a prime opportunity for Congress to use the process to make certain the Export Credit Agency operates with maximum transparency. Congress must, must also ensure it uses proper economic modeling, analyze the potential harm on the U.S. industry and employees from aircraft financing, and works to eliminate all credit agency financing for wide-body aircraft on both, I want to underscore that, on both sides of the Atlantic. ALPA believes that by working together, we can achieve this goal without putting Boeing and it's tens of thousands of employees, and I want to stress there, Boeing is a strategic national asset for the United States, for our defense, for our economy. We can do that without putting them at any financial risk. And we can do this if we sit down at the table together and we don't let the perfect get in the way of the good. Now, there are other examples the taxes and fees currently borne by the U.S. airline industry are higher than those for nearly every other industry in the United States. In passenger rights policy, the U.S. Department of Transportation must weigh the economic impact that a rule will have on U.S. airlines rather than focusing solely on the effect on consumers as they do now. Given the global, global economic playing field, the United States must not only act to reform the policies I just mentioned, but also ensure U.S. open skies agreements become 
fair skies agreements. And don't get me wrong, and don't misquote me on this. ALPA upholds and welcomes efforts to expand entry into international aviation markets where airlines compete on commercial merit. But many of the countries with which the United States has created or is looking to create open skies agreements either own or heavily back their airlines, and this is not fair skies. The fact is, U.S. airlines are at a clear disadvantage in many open skies agreements. Since the United States first began this policy, U.S. share, the U.S. share of the wide body fleet has dropped, international fleet, has dropped from 45 percent to 17 percent today. And the share is forecast to be just 5 percent in, by 2025. And you know, if that number doesn't concern you, well, it should. In addition, many of the U.S. partners and potential partners in air services agreements do not have labor laws that effectively safeguard airline employees. And in 2010, ALPA played a central role in developing a history-making standalone labor article in the U.S.-EU agreement that highlights the value of high labor standards. The labor article is critical because unlike the United States, which has one labor law that applies to all U.S. certificated airlines, whether they're headquarters in Illinois or in Georgia, the EU 28 member states have 28 individual labor laws. And it remains unclear to us and to others which regulatory tax and labor law applies to crew members who may work aboard the aircraft or an airline headquartered in one country be employed by an entity in a second country, be based in a third country, and fly routes primarily out of a fourth. Labor safeguards and open skies agreements are vitally important in international alliances. An open skies agreement is a requirement for antitrust immunity. And the DOT has granted antitrust immunity to U.S. airlines and their foreign alliance partners for years, including for revenue or profit sharing joint ventures. Airline partners in these agreements can divvy revenue and profits according to a predetermined formula, rather than according to who's, who's, who's performing the flying. They have no economic reason to care which airline employees do the flying, and I'm here before you today to tell you that U.S. airline workers care very much who does the flying, and all we want is a fair opportunity to perform it. U.S. aviation policy must foster a robust U.S. airline industry and jobs while allowing airlines to continue to benefit from open skies agreements. ALPA believes it can be done, but only if the United States creates agreements on a go-forward basis that contain provisions that advance the value of high labor standards. And the United States must also identify unfair state-created competitive advantages and account for them in these agreements both in the future and looking back at the 111 Open Skies Agreements already in place. What we need and what we need your support is on Open Skies 2.0, and we'll call this Fair Skies. And let's ensure that our existing and future air transport agreements, when foreign govern governments fuel their airlines with billions of dollars in subsidies and other unfair government support, we have a process in our agreements that allows our carriers and their workers to challenge these subsidies and ensure a level playing field for the United States of America. This is a top priority for ALPA. And we're, all, we're going to be coming to each of you in the future with the goal of gaining your support. The importance of having labor safeguards and open skies agreements is highlighted by the business model of Norwegian Air International. Even though its operations are centered in Norway, 
and its parent company, Norwegian Air Shuttle, NAI has just received an Air Operating Certificate, an AOC, from Ireland, despite the fact that it doesn't plan to operate flights to or from that country. Its Thailand-based crew members will work under individual Singapore contracts and with wages and working conditions far inferior to those of the Norway-based crew members who fly for NAI's parent company operating under a Norwegian AOC. You can't make this up and look, it's a little complicated, okay, but the purpose is very clear. Norwegian Air Shuttle has concocted NAI to get out from underneath Norwegian laws to reduce labor standards for its employees and gain an unfair economic advantage over European and U.S. airlines in attracting international passengers flying to and from the United States. NAI's business model is not based on fair competition, and as a result, it threatens the jobs and the careers of tens of thousands of U.S. airline industry workers by setting a precedence for flag of convenience business plans for Europe. You know, U.S. workers have seen this before. The NAI plan raises the same flag of convenience business practice that undermined the U.S. maritime industry. That practice allowed vessels to be registered in countries different from the ones where they were owned and have the laws of the countries of registry apply to their operations. The result triggered the loss of tens of thousands of U.S. maritime jobs as countries flew the flag of countries with the weakest regulatory tax and labor laws. To make this point, Norwegian Air Shuttle is not contesting that it has created NAI as an Irish company for the purpose of avoiding Norwegian law. ALPA maintains that NAI is designed to undermine labor-related provisions and principles contained in the laws of Norway and the United States, and its operation in the transatlantic market would be inconsistent with the intent of the U.S.-EU transatlantic agreement. In early February, ALPA pilots rallied airline employees from around the globe to Oslo to highlight North American and European airline labor's unified opposition to NAI's bid. Currently, more than 23,000 pilots, other airline employees, our passengers, and U.S. airline industry proponents have signed ALPA's petition opposing NAI's plan and calling on the DOT to immediately and categorically reject it. Keeping to the intent of Open Skies agreements must also be a fundamental goal of any future air transport agreements. Labor standards should be included as part of an Open Skies model text, accounting for state backing and creating a fair opportunity. Creating a fair opportunity for U.S. airlines to compete should be the prime objective of these agreements. And on a related note, the United States should also continue to inform its training partners that air services will not be included in general trade agreements such as the Transatlantic Trade and Investment Partnership, TTIP, and that international air traffic rights will continue to be negotiated separately by the U.S. Department of State and the Department of Transportation. Another outcome of state-backed foreign airlines' wealth is that because of the current lack of career potential, livable wages, and adequate benefits in the U.S. airline industry, many qualified pilots are taking their experience and their skills to work in foreign countries. Given the number of U.S. airline pilots now on furlough and who are working abroad, but who I know and I met with when I was over in the UAE, they would rather work here in the United States. It's planned, it's planned, it's, very obvious to see that there's no real airline pilot shortage in this country today. Now, while some in the airline industry blame the new pilot qualifications and training rules, 
The fact is that the airline industry helped craft those rules. They backed their passage and had years to prepare for their implementation. But I want to stress one thing. There is a current shortage, but it's a shortage of pay and benefits for pilots in the regional airline industry, not of pilots who are capable and certified to fly the airline's equipment. Free markets only function when the rules that guarantee fair competition are enforced. And ultimately, this is about saving the U.S. airlines and all they contribute to the U.S. economy, to national security, and to jobs. And if the U.S. government does not allow U.S. airlines and their workers to compete fairly, the U.S. airline industry as we know it today will disappear. Another New Orleans native, Mickey Patterson Tyler, was the first African-American woman to win, Olympic, to win an Olympic medal when she took bronze in the 200-meter event at the 1948 London Games. Now, I'm a fan of the 200-meter race at the Olympics, but for U.S. airline employees, this is not a sprint. This is a marathon. This is a struggle for the life of our industry, now and in the future. We are driven to compete and to prevail, and the U.S. airlines and their employees need the U.S. government to get off the bench and to join us in the race. Thank you.